Um, I would like to start uh, to introduce, um, first of all, Dr. Mirko Kovac from uh, the Department of Aeronautics. He's going to talk a little bit about robots, as you can see in the title. And uh, my name is uh, Holger Krapp. I'm a professor of um, systems neuroscience in the Department of Bioengineering, and I'm going to talk about the animals. And if there is an animal here, it's a fly, and I will stay actually with insects most of the time. Well, just to motivate our um, interest in insects, and you will see about the connection to robotics a little bit later, uh, I just should, should mention a couple of our experimental animals. Here are uh, portraits. Uh, if we could have the, the lights uh, on the, on the uh, whiteboard a little bit down, that would be brilliant. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so, so there's blowflies, robberflies, hoverflies, and horseflies. And they all fly in different state, uh, ways, basically, because they solve different tasks. And it's quite amazing how they're adapted to do so. Now, I give you here a little example on uh, how these hoverflies, for instance, behave when you find them in the nature. Uh, oh, I probably have to start that video from the, from the computer. Um, this is a hoverfly from, this is a footage from a production of a David Attenborough program showing how the hoverfly is in front of a, a flower maneuvering left and right, almost like a helicopter. And it's really precise in, in its action. Now, I give you another example. Well, we had that one. Here you can actually see, this, this is in London, same program, also again on flying insects and uh, flight all together. Um, you can see here some of our, our lab rats, as it were. So the flies we are working on, and it's taking off and does something quite remarkable. Look at that. So <laughs> these animals can do quite amazing aeronautical stunts, uh, stunts, and we want to understand how they do it. And that's why we are interested in that. You will see very briefly, or very shortly, how this is actually important, or can be important, and very inspirational for the en engineering aspect of what is being worked on here at Imperial College. And Mirko is now taking over and uh, explaining you something about his research and his vision in terms of the robotics. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. So we have seen that insects are really marvelous, marvelous flying machines. And in fact, they're one of the best engineering systems that we could envisage or uh, see, actually, as engineers. At the same time, uh, they're also a bit underappreciated. So when you see flies, they're more annoying. But actually, they're really precious. Now, something similar happens with drones. In fact, they were also quite underappreciated, and they have a bit of a negative image. But at the same time, now we see that they go into a, a variety of different applications, going from agriculture to media to filming to industrial inspection to consumer goods, like uh, using them as toys. And so drones are really one of the next generation of artificial um, animals, basically, that can use and can benefit from biology. So can I just ask here, um, who owns a drone in the room? Can I ask? Oh, quite a lot, yeah? OK, who gifted one last Christmas to somebody else? Almost as many? OK, good. So as you see, drones really become part of our life. And so in this talk, I'll try to uh, outline where and how drones can change our society, can be part of our lives in a positive, uh, positive way. So one application where drones are already used readily is in inspection. So for example, EasyJet is using drones to inspect the aircraft wings in Gatwick Airport before flight. It's much faster, cheaper uh, than using manual inspection. So the drones can really make a difference here. Um, similarly, oil and gas, so for example, BP uses drones to monitor pipelines, monitor their operations. Again, can increase uh, safety, reduce the risk, reduce the costs. There's a lot of different applications where drones, just looking at uh, using them as flying cameras, can make a big difference. Uh, here, another example is a sense fly uh, that uses these uh, flying wings. They, could be, they can be launched, and they fly, take pictures, use their inertial measurement units on board, so the orientation of the robots, and like they stitch the pictures together to create a 3D map of the environment as you see here. So basically, after that, you can collect information and create this 3D map, which is incredibly useful and valuable to plan roads, plan, plan pipelines, and so on. So this is something that already today you can buy. You can go to the market and buy this type of drones. The question is, what happens in 20 years? So that's today. What in 20 years? How will drones look like? 
How will they influence our life? How will they potentially um, benefit our well-being? And so, in fact, I think that in 20 years, our planet will look pretty similar, but it will be different that it uh, actually contains a lot of robotic technology that will make it almost a robotic planet. So we might not be seeing robots that look like uh, in Terminator, you know, walk around, but the robots might actually disappear in the environment, in the fabric of our world, and become invisible, in the same way that our smartphones are completely part of our lives at the moment. So another trend that I would like to highlight here is how, what happens to society. So one big trend, in fact, is that at the moment, we have about 50% of people living in cities. In 20 years, it will be up to 75%. So this is very important. The community aspect will be important, but also the question will come how this uh, increase in urbanization, increase in people living together in cities can be enabled and supported by robotics. And one very as important aspect here is that it will become an interconnection a network of information, robotic technology, and the human. So it will all work together to create these future smart cities that will then be more, um, have a higher level of well-being, health for everyone. So basically it will be all about us, about the humans. And a few ex uh, examples that I would like to talk to you uh, about today, um, where robotics and flying robots in particular can help in that, is first on material flows. So how material flows logistic can be enabled with flying robots how information collection, information flows can be also made uh, more effective with flying robots, and also how our built environment, our architecture, can be also enabled with flying robots. Okay, so if you start with material flows, so what kind of materials do we flow in, in, in cities? What kind of uh, things are important? So it's not just the transport of goods, it's also uh, logistics, it's also waste transport. And so different aspects where actually automation can be very important, autonomous cars being a very important aspect as well. And in fact, if we look at the societal need, and in London in particular, we see that about 360,000 tons of material is flowing through the city every day. So it's a huge amount of material mass that is flowing through our ecosystem, through the city. If you then look at Amazon, we see that 86% is less than two kilograms in weight. So in fact, they're very um, lightweight um, flows. So maybe it's not the most effective way to use a truck that would go from place to place carrying all these small items. Maybe it's much more effective to use a distributed uh, swarm of flying systems, flying robots, that would allow to um, have this logistic system and distribution of those packages much more flexibly and much quicker at much lower cost potentially as well. So that's one of these uh, premises of uh, drone delivery. And I'm sure you've seen that uh, Amazon, for example, is uh, uh, doing that, is looking into that. Here, a PR movie, how these drones could pick up objects, fly autonomously. So it's not just Amazon, it's really also a uh, Google Wing, for example. DHL looks into that as well, and many different delivery services as well. So here, really, the flexibility is the important aspect. OK, so just to mention one example that I'm also involved in personally is to look in drone delivery networks in Africa, in fact. So I think central London is probably the most challenging area where drone delivery uh, can start with. So in fact, the developing countries, for example, rural Africa, um, can be a very good testing ground. In fact, there is a real need as well for drone delivery that could uh, provide uh, blood sample delivery in rural areas, so between hospitals, for example, where currently the ground infrastructure might not be effective and a lot of blood, in fact, is lost during transport. So here, drone delivery can really make a big difference. So we are trialing in 2017 the first uh, trials with those drones in uh, Rwanda, actually. Now, besides logistics, besides the materials, the question is also how and where it should be delivered. So the intelligence, the material, the information is equally important. And these two really have to go in tandem, have to work together. So the information, the intelligence about the city, about what's happening with the delivery and interaction with the city. And so what kind of things do we want to sense in a future city? So one example being, for example, the traffic flow, so traffic management. Again, you could imagine flying vehicles that would monitor the traffic. Then energy management, looking at fires in cities, or so looking at heat losses, um, heating losses, open windows in buildings, and so on, heritage, 
for example, heritage protection that uh, loss, loses energy, and also emergency uh, response, for example, a flooding situation where you might have a flying robot that can help in um, detecting the information and safe. So now currently this is done with a lot of static net, uh, sensors that are distributed or humans that take individual sam samples or provide the information. But what if you could have flying vehicles that would have a curiosity so that would know where something happens and then autonomously follow the phenomena. So they would see a forest fire somewhere far away and then follow to this point and then uh, detect what is needed and guide the rescue teams there more effectively. So this type of now casting actually could provide the real-time data information um, going from big data, not only to be big and a lot of data, but also to be relevant data and sense there where the data is actually needed. So that's one thing that uh, can also help in this aspect. So if you want to do that, if you want to make that happen, uh, one challenge that we have to solve as a university, as a research group, is how to fly and how to um, attach to environments effectively. So to fly, attach, and observe the environment. And so for that, we built these small uh, flying vehicles that can perch to objects. Here you see the small microgliders that perch to walls, buildings, houses, trees. And they use, in fact, a very similar approach as the flies do to attach, to fly, and grasp to the surface, and then fly again, and like this, uh, take off again. So here it's inspired again from the flies, from the perching of flies. Similarly, um, we could imagine that you want to perch to an infrastructure element, such as oil platform, and observe the environment, look at corrosion, look at repairs, look at uh, damage, look at leaks, oil leaks. For example, and also there, we looked at ways how we can build support scaffolds, support elements that would allow other robots to perch to this and then inspect in peace or in much longer time instead of using the propellers to hover in place and like this uh, use much more energy. So this would be a very effective, energy efficient way how to perch to objects. So here, first experiments in the laboratory where this type of my nano drones, they're about palm sized, so very small ones, they can build very large structures like spiders would to then support other robots that would perch to them and observe the environment. So here again, we can learn from nature, from spiders, from building animals, how to do that effectively. Good, so that's just a quick overview. So of course, I cannot go in much detail, but and, uh, just let me mention one more example, and that is uh, oil and water sampling. So imagine you have a flooding situation, like a flood, and you want to know where the bacterial contamination is so you can save people more quickly, so save the people that are in danger because of the bacteria in the water. So to look at that, we, uh, we are developing these aquatic micro-air vehicles or aerial aquatic drones that can fly, then fold the wings, dive into the water, take a water samples, take video footage underwater, and then fly out and fly back again. So if this can, uh, building such a vehicle is, of course, very challenging. And we have to, again, we can look at nature, how nature has solved this type of challenges. So here what you see is a kingfisher. I'm sure you know the kingfishers, right? There are these amazing, beautiful animals that can fly and then see fish and then dive through the water surface to catch the fish. Now, what you see here is, though, that once it has the fish, so it's successful, it's a very happy animal at the moment, but it still needs to uh, go back out. So it needs to fly from the water into the air. And this is, in fact, very hard because it has to flap on one frequency underwater and then at a much higher frequency in air to transition to air because the water is much more dense, much more viscous as well as the air. So doing this transition is really one of the main difficulties. And building a robot that would flap the wings like that would be very difficult. So instead, we can look at ways how squid, for example, jet the water and like this transition from uh, water to air. And so we built these small squid-inspired uh, flying vehicles. So how this works is that we have a CO2 canister at 57 bar, a small valve, that then ejects the water that it picks up in the environment to transition from underwater to air, then opens the wings and flies further. So here you see it's about 50 centimeters long as a water tank, a servo, and can do this transition. Now, if you want to build that, of course, it's very difficult. Uh, if we want to make it very lightweight, so we need to model this. We need to do unsteady Bernoulli to model the transition here with the with the water that gets, gets, gets expelled. We have losses in the valve, as can be modeled with these valve equations. We can then eventually determine the forces and the impulse created by this type of vehicle. 
and then model this to optimize it to be very effective at this transition. So we really have to use the mathematics, use engineering to actually build it very effectively, although the principle might be inspired from nature. So we've done this, so that's one of the valve systems we have to build to allow for this transition, and we can then optimize to make it very optimal, this type of system. So we have to use the mathematics, but we can be inspired from nature. And so this is one example in High Park, actually where it jumps through the water surface using only onboard energy and power that it has. So it can actually do this successfully uh, to fly out. Um, yeah. <laughs> so here we had to entertain these swans uh, <laughs> to um, not come to the animals, of course, to the robots. Okay, so another approach that we can take instead of using compressed gas is to use a, a combustion to do this transition. So in fact, what we looked here at is uh, water reacting fuels that, for example, calcium carbide, if you put it in water, it creates acetylene gas, which we then ignite and eject the water like that. So with only about one gram of calcium carbide, we can have 10 launches and have these type of vehicles that would use combustion to eject themselves out as well. So here we looked at an alternative approach to instead of using compressed gas, we used combustion with water reacting fuels to make this transition, which is an alternative approach, how to create the pressure as well. So just there are different ways how this can be um, achieved. So the last um, topic, just uh, two more minutes that I want to talk about is the architecture. So how could robots help us in providing a safe and also to maintain the architecture, the build environment, to build the build environment eventually, to manufacture it? And so here one need is, of course, to inspect any kind of uh, damages, potential damages, but then also to repair them. So what if they could go there and repair them on site right away when you see that there is damage? Then how could they eventually be used to build or construct the structures? So to do that, we look into ways how 3D printing can help in that and how we can have flying 3D printers. So flying robots that act as a 3D printer to put up layers and like this build up a structure to repair or build up larger elements. So that's in fact a larger project that we have in, in the laboratory. Um, that also uh, looks a bit like that. So that's a flying vehicle. And as you see, deposits here polyurethane foam relatively precisely on a location like this could, up build, could build up layers to do that. So the scenario would be that you have a rescue site, let's say a disaster zone like in Nepal, for example, or in any kind of situation that it's hard to access, and you have these flying robots that will build up uh, rescue shelters just in places where people cannot go very easily. Um, <clears throat> so one first step, of course, it's a longer-term vision, but one first step is to use this type of approaches to also repair pipelines. So for example, if you have a pipeline and you have a pipeline leak, you could have the same approach to repair those leaks. And in fact, that's a recent demonstration that we have done in the, the Drones for Good competition in Dubai. Uh, in February, about two months ago, three months ago, where you have this leak and you have this flying robot that has this uh, support arm that balances the imprecision of the flight and like this can repair the leak on site autonomously. So we're very uh, happy that we won one of the awards for this application, showing that actually it can be used, so it's a potential use of uh, first step also to um, use them and using like nest building bird inspired ways how to repair those type of structure, uh, structures in the industry that can be very important. This then also can be applied to heritage protection, to repairing churches and like this, uh, protect our society and you know, help in our national identity. So the question now is, how can we make this autonomous? How can we do this faster, do it with vision, in the same way as insects and animals do that? And for that, I give the word back to Holger, who will tell us how nature solves very simpler, similar examples of autonomy and autonomous flight. Thanks, Mirko. Okay, so if we can have the, yeah, um, I'll set back. Right, before I talk a little bit about the science we do in our laboratory to try to extract some principles that can then be applied to what Mirko was talking about, so to create robots that are more autonomous and don't rely on external information so much such as uh, GPS or something else, um, uh, we, uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, draw a little comparison here, or well, actually ask you a question, what do they have in common? Right. Well, they do both fly, and I think that's, the, that's a very good starting point. 
but they have also something else in common, and some of you might have stumbled across that. They are aerodynamically completely unstable. So if you throw them in the air and they have no powerful feedback control, then they just crash because they are not passively stabilized. So they need to have some control uh, architecture on board as well. But if you put that together, something that's very instable, inherently instable, and you combine that with very powerful feedback, what you get is exceptional maneuverability. Well, that's actually why it might make sense to look at flies and see how they do it. Well, they definitely do it in a completely different way than, uh, than the, the, the F-22 is doing it, uh, because, um, well, the F-22 is using wave a very smaller number of, of sensors like pitot tubes and uh, inertial measurement units to assess how it's moving in, in, in space at any point in time. And then it works out somehow the control commands. While in flies, this is a little sheep low fly, uh, they use many different systems. The visual system of which they are actually two, in fact. They use a little gyroscopic sense organ that gives them angular uh, rotation rates, which are very useful for feedback, and many other sensilla. Now, if we put that into some sort of block diagram then, and you don't, we don't want to go in too much detail here, but anyway, so you use here, in case of the jet fighter, a few sensors, but then the core of what's happening are three supercomputers. And these three supercomputers are then coming up with control commands that are actually applied to the uh, control surfaces, including the aileron, uh, maybe the rudder. So you have this element here, supercomputing. Lots of energy that needs to be pumped in there, lots of number crunching, lots of uh, math that needs to be solved. If we look at a fly and how the fly is using, say, its eyes to control what the, the, the wings are doing, generating um, uh, the lift it requires to stay stable in the air and control it, and then also the neck, because the flies are compensating uh, for any body rotation with their head, and I'll show you a little bit um, on that a little bit later, then you can see actually there's no supercomputing here. It's just not there. They just use the information from their sensor, integrate it in a very clever way, and can use the output of the sensors directly to control their mo movements. And how that's done, we can actually try to understand when we look at the different levels in the system from the sensors, the eyes, and as a matter of fact, we look into the brain, we might be able to do that, uh, we look into the brain how it's working. Basically, the instability applies to the robots, or some of those anyway, uh, Mirko was talking about before, and that's actually why we want to use the, the, some of the principles from flies then to improve um, also the, the, the performance of uh, micro air vehicles. Again, same principle. Now here's again our experimental animal, and we can study its behavior. We can measure, really, the activity in individual brain cells which respond to visual motion, and you will see in a second why this is really important. Well, sorry, uh, uh, we also need to understand, well, as soon as we have the, the control signals, we also need to understand what, is, what needs to be controlled. So how is the flight motor actually working? How is it using control signals to actually stay stable or make sure the flight stays stable in the air? And then, of course, if we have come up with some results, then it may be applied in uh, uh, whatever um, uh, specific cases um, to see how we can improve uh, engineering. Now, one of the major um, sensory modalities, as it were, the fly is using is actually the compound eyes. And that's why I always show the portrait, because it shows these huge eyes, which has almost, have almost panoramic vision. They can see everywhere, except for a tiny little angle behind them that's obstructed by the body. But it makes a huge difference whether you have only small visual field or large visual field um, if you want to know, by means of using visual information, how you move in space. I introduce a concept now that's called optic flow. So if you, if you move around or when you move around and you move forward, then the whole world is shifting across your eyes from front to back. Now, if you rotate your head or whatever, the whole world is rotating around that axis you rotate your head around. And this, these uh, different flow fields can be nicely illustrated by, a pro or have been nicely illustrated by a program um, put together by the BBC called Animal Camera. What you can see here, unfortunately the contrast is not very high here, but you can see the head of a goshawk, and it's gliding through the woods. Now let me show you that. Uh, on the back of the goshawk there's a camera, so it records basically the motion sequence um, 
that is generated simply because the camera is moving through the woods on the back of that goshawk. Now this is a sl uh, slow motion presentation of it. You can see it's rotating left and right, and you get these streamlines of motion blur, which are due to the very slow uh, shutter speed here, and that indicates actually what these optic flow fields look like. Now you can then take uh, the next step and say, well, let's try to quantify this. So during two different situations, so in one case it's rolling, just around the, this, this, this uh, longitudinal body axis. And in the other case, it's gliding. And you can see from the two different vector fields here, this is while it's rolling, this is while it's gliding, that they look very differently. Now, if the visual system could manage to analyze these optic flow fields and then use this signal uh, it is deriving from that directly for the controls, then whenever it's rolling, it could counter-rotate um, right away. Right? So you don't need a supercomputer if you have access to all this information um, that is presented in optic flow fields. Now, how does the visual system do that, in fact? Um, and that's actually um, where I will uh, talk a, a little bit about the research again. Um, now, we know that in the uh, compound eye, as it were, right, these huge eyes of, of the flies, um, the direction of visual motion is analyzed. So if you want to understand, the, or if you want to analyze the flow patterns, you would have to analyze all the little local white arrows you saw on the, on the previous slide. And that requires a mechanism that tells you in which direction things are moving in the visual field. But we know that um, in, uh, in flies, so this sort of analysis of directional motion takes place along the rows in the hexagonal eye lattice. Well, Oh, this is just uh, to um, uh, bring up again a, a nice little uh, uh, cartoon by a, a fairly famous cartoonist. Uh, that is actually wrong. Well, you can imagine that probably. What the fly really sees is only this. And if you, if you want to go to the stand in the robotics forum, we have a camera set up that, that allows you to view the world through the eyes of a fly. And then you can actually appreciate that one. And, and um, that's not very good. So the spatial resolution in the fly eye is lousy, but it is 10 times faster than our visual system, and that makes up for lots of that um, really rough spatial resolution. Anyway, in the fly visual system, there are individual nerve cells we can actually point at in terms of putting the finger on and say, this is the, the nerve cell uh, VS1, and this is VS2, and so forth. These cells, we know, respond to visual motion. And I show you an experiment in the lab that's pretty routinely done in our uh, lab. So the fly is actually in the center here, and we record the activity, the electrical signals, from one of its nerve cells. And at the same time, we show it a, a, a moving dot. That's re real speed. And you can actually see, if you correlate the movement of the dot with the responses of these individual neurons, that it's responding to directional motion. And always once during the cycle, it's massively responding, and in the opposite phase, it's, it's inhibited. So this is actually a neuron that could be very useful in analyzing optic flow. If we analyze all the results, then we realize that individual neurons, like VS1 or VS6 or VS8, they, are, they have a field of sensitivity to motion that looks very much the same like an optic flow field. And what they do is very simple. They match, basically, their detection um, of visual motion to the patterns they need to sense when they want to use um, or want to control visually their movements in space. And that is a very powerful concept because once you have a neuron, a cell that is responding, this one here would re, re, uh, respond to the roll flow field I showed earlier in case of the goshawk, or this one here is responding to a combination of roll and pitch, then you can apply this knowledge or this principle directly uh, to robotic applications. And um, here's an example for that, where this micro air vehicle here uh, receives visual input, and it's cast onto a CCD chip. It can be analyzed then, and then used exactly the same way the fly would use that to control the distance to the walls, control the forward speed, and also its bearing. 
Now, that sounds a little bit nasty, but it shows you that the principles we extract from the visual system in flies can, in fact, be used can be used, sorry about the noise, can be used and actually are working in these platforms. Well, sorry. Now, there is another um, very important behavior that is, this is important simply for one reason. Um, if you want to use this principle where you analyze optic flow, or this big, these big patterns, and then use the output of these neurons to control your movement, then your head needs to be stable, right? It needs to be in one default orientation so that the input is provided in the right way. Actually, our visual system is lined up in a, in a particular way as well, and it helps us interpreting visual input. So if you try to read your program upside down, it takes you way longer time to do so um, compared to the uh, situation where it's um, lined up the right way around. Gaze stabilization is massively important. And we, of course, we are interested now how, how well can fly do that. Now, this is a standard experiment again we do where we look at the gaze stabilization in the fly. So we can connect them to a little motor that is oscillating the thorax, the, the, the body of the fly, and then we can see how well it can keep the head aligned with the external horizon. This actually is a very useful information for us to understand how the sensors are acting together to support flight control and gaze control at the same time. Now, I just show you uh, without going into the, uh, the exact results, I will just show you something here. This is a different species than the blowfly, and this is pretty amazing. We want to understand what the general principles are. That means we not only look in one species, but in many species. But in many cases, the, the, the reason for this being, there are some general principles. They all do it in a similar way. But then you have adaptations to specific tasks that are done by one species, but not the other. And that actually... Um, uh, um, allows us actually to, to understand different levels. Now, what's so remarkable about this one here, this is a hoverfly, is that at slow speeds, it's hardly responding at all. But the faster you go with your oscillation, the better the stabilization becomes. And this is actually getting to up to 20 oscillations per second, which means angular velocity is up, up to 5,000 degrees per second. It's pretty remarkable. Now, one last one on this one here. Um, now, this is a different animal, same experiment. It doesn't take care of the stimulus and can move its head pretty massively. Well, this is something you always get to know if you do biology experiments. They do sometimes what they want. I'm not implying that they have free will, but they are capricious sometimes. Okay, now we want to understand really the motor systems as well, and I have to show you this um, slide here. Uh, which is uh, done in collaboration with the Natural History Museum next door with a very specialized micro-CT. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the, um, allowing you to obtain the three-dimensional structure of the whole fly. I mean, you can see here the head, the thorax, and now I will um, zoom through the whole system um, in three dimensions. And... Uh, uh, what we, want, we are interested in, in particular, it's really unfortunate that the contrast is so low here at the, at the front. This area here where the neck motor system is, we are interested in understanding how the muscles are connected between um, the head and the body. And then knowing how the muscles are connected, we could actually infer in a way or mathematically model as well how these muscles will really move the head. And that is the other end of the story we always need to understand not only the sensory input and how that is processed, but also what ultimately needs to be controlled. That's why we need to understand the motor system. Actually, and this um, imaging technique allows you to see in quite some detail at a level of a couple of micrometers what is going on in the fly. Here are actually the segment muscles um, shown in, in this um, uh, reconstruction. And uh, the next thing we can do with that, um, in the interest of time, I have to jump to the next level, is using all the three-dimensional data we have, putting it in this, what's called a finite element model, assigned to each of those individual nodes mechanical properties, and then actually make predictions about if you activate one muscle, a particular muscle, how is the head going to move? And then, of course, in, in the next step, we can do um, an experimental validation of that. But 
Let me just show you a little example. This is a simple sort of pitch movement of the head that we simulate here. And um, uh, just to illustrate the principle. So at the stand, uh, um, um, Peter Sward, who is doing this work, uh, would be able to answer some question on that. Now, from three dimensions, that is already quite some achievement at that resolution. And Peter has been working very hard with the people in the Natural History Museum to drive the resolution to this level. This one here is a little bit different. In this case, we have actually flies flying in a particle accelerator. The technique is basically the same. It's x-ray based, like you get at your physician. But it is specialized in terms of faster and more detailed so that we can actually see the, uh, the thorax of the fly in action. So it is moving on the spot, beating its wings. You can see here the wing hinge. This is the whole thorax, the powerful mechanical oscillator that's moving up and down the, uh, the wings. And now you will see in a second that we can zoom through the system. These are the powerful muscles uh, causing the, 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 the um, movement of the wings. But then, of course, if you have just a mechanical oscillator, then the fly would all end. It's going left, right, same way. It would always go on, you know, on a, straight, a straight line. So you need to have what's called steering muscles, which actually change the pronation angle of the wing bead, the, the angle of attack of the blades, and produce, pr produce, therefore, different lifts, or the amplitude in the wing bead as well. And this is exactly, you saw them in action in a, sec uh, a second ago. These are these steering muscles, which can ultimately introduce maneuvers. Now, if we understand how the sensors are controlling the action of those, we are a large step further. We're working on that currently. Right, I think um, this is actually what I um, wanted to talk about in terms of the research we do in insects. And I think I give back um, to Mirko now, and uh, he can summarize our uh, presentation here. OK, thank you very much. So as you've seen, um, there are a lot of examples in nature and engineering that are very similar, and the challenges are very similar. And if you go to a shop today, you can buy drones that take pictures. You can buy drones for toys, a few hundred pounds, a few thousand pounds for research level quadcopters or uh, inspection robots, a few hundred thousands or millions for these military larger drones. So there are really different levels, different types of drones. Now, the next step is then that they will interact with the environment, do repairs, do building, do delivery. That's really what's happening in the next few years. Now, to make this a reality, we need biology, and we need these um, approaches of robot vision, how vision can be used to avoid obstacles, to do swarming flight, how the muscles can be actuated in a way to do effective flapping wing motions, how the aerodynamics of feathers and bird wings can be understood to build robots that use the same principles. And what is very important here is that it's really a philosophical shift in the way how engineering is working. So traditionally, robotics um, is based on the idea that you have a sensor that takes in information, then you have a big computer, like the supercomputer of the fighter jet, that then does a lot of things with a lot of information, and then puts it out to actuator, which then does one step. Then again, the sensors come in, and you have this loop, and if you have a supercomputer, you can do this fast enough to actually do something in the real world. Now, insects use something very different. It's much more reactive, much more adaptive, much more real-time, and much more selective on the way which information is used, potentially. So there is a research paper in the 80s that was written by Rodney Brooks at MIT uh, with the title, Elephants Don't Play Chess. Right? And there is a point in that. Elephants don't think about it. They just run. They walk, run. Flies just fly. They fly into objects when they fly the window. The opening in the wind, they fly out. So it's a very different design philosophy. And this is also referred to as the new artificial intelligence, or new AI, which is the way of using very low level, using the body, using the embodied intelligence to solve uh, real world challenges. So I think these uh, relationships and these uh, collaborations at Hogger, also myself, we are actually doing research together. Uh, I think this can be very uh, transformational for uh, engineering and for robotics. Now, what do we need? We need um, the vision, we need the strategy, and we need also your involvement, the involvement of everyone. So what happens at the moment is that UAV startups, so flying robot startups, are basically the Airbuses and the BEA systems and so on of tomorrow. So all these big aerospace companies were also startups at some point. 
So what you see now, we have a huge growth in these uh, companies, and there's a huge and real potential of investment and on, of involvement in this uh, space. The type of work they can do is everything that is dangerous, that is dull, that is dirty, where humans don't want to go, where you don't want to send someone, or you need information very quickly or at a low risk. And so instead of having um, this type of gas mask um, type of interactions, you send a robot there. Similarly, in resilience, recovery, search and rescue, where you can use the robots to provide the information that helps you to guide your rescue teams and save more effectively the people that are in danger, which can make a real difference. And eventually also, they can be used to uh, detect environmental markers, environmental parameters, and provide a more sustainable and more um, healthy environment for all of us to live in. So I think flying robots have a bit of a negative connotation uh, they had uh, maybe 10 years ago, but now really the space opens to a very positive and widespread use of them. So eventually we have the robotic planet that will be the future, and robotics is the big technological transformation and revolution that is happening at the moment. It is also a human planet, so we have to keep this uh, in mind of how we can use robotics to support humanity, and then eventually create this smart planet which really combines the two. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. okay, so we have uh, time for a few questions, anything, discussion. Please also visit our stands in the Great Hall. We have flying robot demos and demos of the vision. If you want to be a fly or feel like one, uh, please come <laughs> by. Not entirely. So any questions, please? Well, I think there is research going on at, at two different levels. A, uh, there are models about the general behavior as a swarm, as a phys physical system in a way. But then B, there is, of course, uh, research into uh, trying to find out how the visual system of insects is detecting whether something is coming close to it or is, is receding from it. These sort of looming detection circuits in the nervous system. There's lots of examples there. And in fact, this is one of the things we, Milko and I, are, are, are working on, trying to implement at some point on uh, the drones. Yes, that would be also Dwyer inspired. What is the biggest challenge ahead in terms of choosing a robotic pilot? Uh, mm -hmm. So, I think there are a lot of different challenges <laughs> in that. Um, a big part is um, doing the engineering in a holistic way. So not just looking at the control question of how to control engineering systems, not just building new type of hardware, but also really putting the different disciplines, even in engineering, as different disciplines, computer science, robot vision, hardware design, electronics, microprocessors, to already really combine that and think of it and work together and really have an interdisciplinary and holistic approach to a robot. So a robot is much more than the control system or the body. It's the body and the control system together. So this really is a change in also approach how we have to do it, which makes it more effective. Thank you. So what are the advantages of a Bow-inspired vision system compared to a computer vision system? Uh, well, at the moment, one of the major limitations with most computer vision systems on uh, drones is that they have a limited uh, field of view. So that's one thing, and it's very clear. So if you watch out for a particular pattern you need to recognize to be able to control certain maneuvers, then you have to have a wide field of view. That's why they all have developed these. And you, don't hardly, fi you hardly find that in any micro air vehicles these days with, the pa with panoramic vision. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is the way in which the information is extracted from these cameras or whatever and then used for the controls. In biology, it is actually using lots of local noisy measurements to come up with some very robust signal, one signal that can then be used for the controls right away. And in um, uh, technical systems so far, you often use some computer vision algorithms to work out local motion, which is computationally very expensive and takes more time. 
Okay, maybe one more last question. Someone, if somebody has something. Please also talk to us later on if you feel like. Yeah, in fact, the energy is a big, one of the mm. biggest challenges yeah. because the, the lightweight, you have to be very lightweight and batteries are very heavy. Usually this type of uh, two kilograms type uh, drones can fly up to about 20 minutes. The small ones, a few minutes, maybe five minutes. And so then the question comes in, into the play, how do you reduce the energy consumption on one side, so make better processors, mm. maybe use optic flow vision that uses less computer, um, computer like energy, less energy, than a full vision system mm. with onboard, I don't know, vision processing with graphics chips and so on. So this could be one mm. pathway. The other pathway is to perch, so to attach to structures and not even fly, but stay there. Like this prolong the mission time. And the third one being improving the aerodynamics as well, for example. Mm. So energy is one of the big questions that can be solved in many different approaches. Mm. Actually, that is one of the major research areas in biology even trying to understand under which constraints the nervous system is solving all these problems. And it turns out that because energy is such a big constraint for us as well, that the, the way in which information is processed is always fairly efficient. And that could be then transferred to some developments in engineering as well. Just to mention one last thing is that the inspiration comes from biology, but the, the engineering can also help to oh, understand yeah. questions in yeah. biology. So it's a closed loop. It's a, Synergy is yes. not just feeding off yeah. of biology, <laughs> it's actually feeding back yes. into it, hopefully. I can only confirm that. My last department was zoology before I came here, and I knew why I would come here, and, and, and I know why I'm very happy here, because being um, in the, uh, well, interacting and, and collaborating with engineers is a massive help for us to understand biological systems if you go for a more qualitative approach, using engineering methods to understand biology. So that's exactly what Mirko was uh, um, hinting at. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very coming. much for coming.